Thanks, Renuka, for the introduction. I appreciate the invitation to come here. Um, I'm going to talk about a relatively new type of therapy, one that we're hoping will be FDA approved in the United States in the next uh, several months, um, uh, called peptide receptor radiotherapy, uh, also known as radio-labeled somatostatin analogs. The concept is simple. Um, most neuroendocrine tumors express receptors to a hormone called somatostatin. They express these receptors as small molecules on the cell surface. Uh, I'm sure many of you are on somatostatin analogs, drugs like octreotide or lanreotide to control hormonal syndromes and tumor growth. So the concept here, do we have a slide? We don't have a laser pointer, do we? All right. So the concept is basically by attaching a radioactive molecule to a somatostatin analog, uh, you can deliver radiation directly to the tumor cells. The, the, the combination of the analog and the radioactive molecule are actually incorporated into the cell, internalized into the cell, causing damaging radiation. There have been several generations of uh, radioactive isotopes used. The first was indium-111, which is basically the same isotope used in the Octria scan, but it has very weak anti-cancer effects. Uh, next came yttrium-90, uh, which is a beta-emitting isotope um, uh, with stronger uh, effects on causing tumor damage, and more recently, lutetium-177, which has an intermediate particle range, a long half-life, and so probably the best combination of benefit versus risk when it comes to these radioactive isotopes. As far as terminology, it's really quite simple. There's several types of somatostatin analogs used. You can use octreotide, which is uh, uh, the, the also known as sandostatin. You can use octreotate, which is slightly modified and has higher affinity to certain somatostatin receptor subtypes. We use a chelator, which is basically a cage that contains the isotope, and there's several. One is called DOTA, and then the isotope. Uh, again, typically yttrium-90 or lutetium-177. So if it's a lutetium attached to DOTA, attached to octreotate, it's called lutetium dotatate, which is a term some of you may have heard of. So if we look back historically, this is a treatment with, that was developed in the 1990s, primarily in Europe. It, even though it was not approved until yesterday in Europe, it was um, administered by different institutions as in, as in-house preparations. Basically, these institutions combined the molecule with the somatostatin analog and were permitted to deliver it for, uh, for patients. Uh, so with indium-111, we see very low rates of tumor shrinkage, around, uh, uh, you know, zero to 10%. Uh, uh, with yttrium-90, higher rates of tumor shrinkage, and perhaps the highest rates of tumor shrinkage with lutetium-177, roughly 20 to 40%. And by tumor shrinkage, we mean significant tumor shrinkage the tumor shrinking by about 50%. Perhaps even more striking is the average time until tumor growth. This is what we call progression-free survival. And if we look at um, both yttrium and lutetium, the historical data, the average time till tumor growth was roughly a year and a half to three years. This compares quite favorably with other um, drugs that uh, have been developed in recent years, like everolimus or sunitinib. So I want to hone in a little bit on the experience from Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands where this treatment was first developed and where they've accumulated a lot of experience over the past um, uh, 15 years or so. They looked at a group of over 1,200 patients who were treated over that time. Uh, they excluded foreign patients, for example, patients from the United States who didn't have good long-term follow-up over there, and uh, focused on about 600 patients with gastroenteropancreatic and lung neuroendocrine tumors, which is really what we're talking about primarily today. Um, and looked at both efficacy and safety. The treatment that they've been doing there since 2000 consists of four cycles of lutetium dotatate uh, every eight weeks uh, for four treatments. So one treatment every eight weeks for four treatments. So the entire course of treatment is given over approximately eight months. Um, the treatment is administered intravenously. Uh, patients actually start with an amino acid infusion roughly 30 to 60 minutes prior to the lutetium. And the point of that is to uh, protect the kidneys and prevent radiation damage to the kidneys. And they continue with the amino acids. Then they receive the lutetium over a period of about an hour, and uh, the amino acids continue afterwards for a total of about four to six hours. 
Um, patients generally are asked to stop their long-acting sandostatin or somatuline about four to six weeks prior to each administration so as not to compete with the somatostatin receptors. Uh, but the somatostatin analog can be resumed either later th in the day or a day after um, the radioactive uh, lutetium treatment. So if we look at response rates uh, based on the specific type of neuroendocrine tumor, uh, starting with midgut, midgut of course being the small intestine, cecum, the most common type of neuroendocrine tumor, uh, the response rates were roughly 30%, um, with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors even higher, about 50-55%. Uh, uh, hindgut refers primarily to rectal, those are fairly uncommon, it was about 30%. So across the board, more or less 30 to 50% rates of significant tumor shrinkage. And if we look at average time to tumor growth, uh, it really confirms what I described earlier, average tum time to tumor growth of roughly uh, 20 to 30 months or, or uh, roughly two to two and a half years. All right, well, these were the slides that you just missed. So <laughs> anyway, this describes the administration. Again, it's every eight weeks for four treatments. We talked about the amino acids. Uh, patients also should receive nausea prevention. And here's the description of the responses. Um, as far as side effects, the main thing that we're concerned about is low blood counts. Just like chemotherapy, you can have low blood counts with this form of treatment. Um, the rate of severe decrease in blood counts is quite low, less than 10%, and it almost always recovers uh, within two or three months. One of the main risks or concerns with this type of therapy is long-term toxicity. Um, at least in theory, uh, peptide receptor uh, radiotherapy can be associated with damage to the kidneys, but the good news is that with use of lutetium as opposed to yttrium and appropriate use of amino acid prophylaxis, uh, virtually no patients develop severe kidney dysfunction. Um, and if you look at the average decline in kidney function after this treatment, it's roughly 3% versus more or less 1% in normal older adults. So there is minor toxicity to the kidneys, but very few patients develop kidney, significant kidney dysfunction. As far as long-term bone marrow uh, side effects, it is a real but rare concern. So uh, about 2% of patients can develop what's called irreversible bone marrow damage, usually about an average of about five years after treatment. And that manifests by conditions such as myelodysplastic syndrome or more rarely acute leukemia. That's probably the main risk associated with this treatment. Um, liver uh, uh, toxicity is almost never seen. And perhaps not surprisingly, there's a correlation between amount of um, somatostatin receptor expression measured either on the Octrea scan or more recently on the Gallium 68 dotatate scan. The more strongly we see receptor expression, the more likely uh, the patient is to respond to this type of treatment, which is not surprising. So that's a good predictive marker. So until now, uh, virtually all the data has come from single arm studies and primarily from large institutional series, not good prospective clinical studies. The Nutter one was the first attempt uh, to do a good phase three randomized clinical trial to prove that this treatment works with a high level of evidence. So the population chosen was mid-gut, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. These are the tumors that originate in the ileum, the cecum, um, sometimes a little bit more proximal in the small intestine. These are the most common type of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and most often associated with the carcinoid syndrome. Uh, the investigational arm of the study was the lutetium-177 dotatate, again given once every eight weeks for four treatments. Uh, the control arm in this randomized study was high-dose octreotide, sandostatin. So the standard dose of sandostatin that perhaps many of you receive is 30 milligrams every four weeks. In this trial, patients uh, uh, were randomized either to lutetium or 60 milligrams, double dose of sandostatin. The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival, in other words, time until tumor growth, uh, which was uh, evaluated by a central radiologist 
um, uh, who was blinded to treatment assignment. In other words, the radiologist who was reading the scans um, did not, was not aware whether the patient was receiving uh, the lutetium or the high dose of triotide. And that's really the essence of a, a randomized phase three study to really prove if a treatment works. So inclusion, basically adults with well-differentiated grade one or two mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. All of the patients had to have disease progression on standard dose sandostatin. Um, that progression could have occurred over a long time, as long as three years, but there had to be proven disease progression. And they all had to have evidence of somatostatin receptor expression on Optria scan. So if you look at uh, uh, patient characteristics, they were mostly low-grade tumors, but about one-third were intermediate grade. Uh, this, is a, this next thing is a measure of uptake on Octreoscan, and most patients had very strong uptake on Octreoscan, indicating strong expression of somatostatin receptors. And, mo and an average patient had very high levels of chromogranin and 5-hydroxy acetic acid, which is not surprising for this population of mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. So these are the progression-free survival curves. They basically track um, um, time till tumor growth over time. And you can see with high dose octreotide, most patients progressed relatively quickly. The median patient, the average patient, progressed after eight months. With lutetium dotatate, at the time of the primary analysis, fewer than half the patients had actually progressed. So there was no median progression free survival at that time point. What this translates to if you look at the entirety of the curves, is that there was a 79% improvement in time until tumor growth or death with this treatment, which was highly clinically and highly statistically significant. So um, this really proves that the drug did what it's meant to do clinically and statistically. As far as um, other endpoints of the study, response rate, the response rate was only about 3% with the high-dose octreotide. It was 18% with the uh, lutetium dotatate. So Roughly 20% of patients had very significant tumor shrinkage, but as you can see, a lot of more patients had disease stabilization. And with respect to overall survival, um, it was improved by about 50%. Now, this is a preliminary analysis of overall survival. There needs to be confirmatory analysis uh, in, in the next several years, but certainly very encouraging uh, preliminary results showing that the drug almost certainly improves survival in this disease, which is really the ultimate endpoint of any, any trial, and really something that has not been demonstrated with pretty much any other treatment in this disease. Our trials are not generally powered to evaluate effects on overall survival, so it's very encouraging. We had some new data on improvement in quality of life, um, showing that patients treated with lutetium versus high dose octreotide had significant improvement in global health. Uh, that basically, uh, that basically has one part of a questionnaire where patients are asked to rate their overall quality of life and overall health. Also in uh, what's called role functioning, which are things like hobbies, work, ability to engage in, in normal activities, improvement in diarrhea, which is obviously a main side effect for patients with carcinoid syndrome, and improvement in pain and fatigue. So across the board, significant evidence of uh, positive improvement in quality of life. So, you know, with the results of the Netter one, we now have fairly conclusive proof that this drug actually has a major impact on this disease, both on uh, progression-free survival, almost certainly on overall survival, and on quality of life. Um, as Renuka mentioned, uh, even though the drug has been administered in Europe over several decades, it was never commercially approved. It's now commercially approved in Europe as of yesterday, and we're hoping for similar approval in the United States in January. Thanks very much.